Hello. This is so un Lawrence of us. Look at us all on time here. <laughs> Seven o'clock and we're ready to go. Uh, well, hello. I am Polly Ken. I'm the Reader Services Coordinator here at the Lawrence Public Library. Um, before I start, I have a few housekeeping items for you. So the bathrooms are on just either side of these doors here. Um, should you have a need. Uh, I wanted to let everyone know that we are nearing the end of Booktoberfest, if you haven't been paying attention. Um, that's been our big celebration of books, reading, and community. So if you've been to everything, that's fabulous. If you've, this is the first thing you've been to, thank you very much. We've had an amazing time this month. Um, our big wrap-up party is Friday night, the Book of Love prom. We'd love to see you there. Uh, doors open at 7. Um, free snacks, cash bar. So, um, and then a big thank you to the Raven Bookstore for selling. Thank you, Raven. And Sarah will be signing directly after tonight at that table back there. So um, with that out of the way, I want to say that we're thrilled to be hosting Sarah Paretsky, a Lawrence local who has had an indelible impact on the literary world world. I don't have to tell all you because you're here. Um, Sarah's mother, Mary Paretsky, was a beloved librarian at LPL, which gives Sarah an even more of a special place in our librarian hearts as we proudly welcome her home. I saw a meme recently that said, I have made it my mission to unteach children. I changed it to people. That fiction is fake. Here are my definitions. Nonfiction equals learning through information. Fiction equals learning through imagination. As the coordinator for the fiction department here at LPL, I couldn't agree more. Books, the stories they convey, offer us many ways to learn through imagination. They offer us solace, hope, recognition, empathy, perspective, spicy time with vampires. Um, <laughs> you know, the power of words, the vital importance of telling and reading stories is what brings us together as a community for Booktoberfest, and what especially brings us here this evening to hear Sarah speak on that very subject. Tonight, Sarah will be introduced by one of our Book Squad members, Shirley Bronlick. Shirley has been with the Lawrence Public Library for 30 years, so let's all give her a hand for that. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, she is passionate about the mystery genre, social justice, and the natural world, and she's a champion of all three in her work. For years, Shirley has run the Mystery Book Club, one of our most popular here at LPL, and I'm so pleased to bring Shirley up here tonight to welcome one of her literary icons. Hi. Yeah, this is quite an honor for me. Um, Sarah is a heroine of mine. Sarah Paretsky revolutionized the mystery world in 1982 when she introduced V.I. Warshawski in Indemnity Only by creating a detective with the grit and smarts to take on the mean streets. Paretsky challenged a genre in which women historically were vamps or victims. V.I. struck a chord with readers and critics. Indemnity Only was followed by 20 more V.I. novels. Her voice and her world remain vital to readers. Today, Sarah Paretsky's books are published in 30 countries. While Paretsky's fiction changed the narrative about women, her work also opened doors for other writers. In 1986, she created Sisters in Crime, a worldwide organization to advocate for women crime writers, which earned her Ms. Magazine's 1987 Woman of the Year Award. More accolades, fo accolades followed. The British crime writers awarded her the Cartier Diamond Dagger for Lifetime Achievement, and she has received the honorary degree of Doctor of Letters from a number of universities. Called passionate and electrifying, VI reflects her creator's own passion for social justice. After chairing the school's first commission on the status of women as a Kansas University undergraduate, Paretsky worked as a community organizer in Chicago's South Side during the turbulent race riots of 1966. Since then, Paretsky's volunteer work has included advocating for health care for the mentally ill homeless, mentoring teens in Chicago's most troubled schools, and working with reproductive rights. 
Through her Sarah and 2C Dogs Foundation, she also helps build science, technology, engineering, and mathematics and arts programs for young people. Koretsky detailed her journey from Kansas Farm Girl to New York Times bestseller in her 2007 memoir, Writing in an Age of Silence, which was a National Book Critics Circle Award finalist. In addition, Paretsky has written two standalone novels, Ghost Country and Bleeding Kansas, set in the part of rural Kansas where Paretsky grew up. She has published several short story collections, most recently Love and Other Crimes, and has edited numerous other anthologies, like her fictional detective, Paretsky has an adored golden retriever. Please welcome Sarah Paretsky. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thanks to Kathleen Morgan and the Friends of the Library Foundation for their generous sponsorship of tonight's event. I uh, am really proud of coming from this town, and one of the things that I'm proudest of is Lawrence's commitment to the public library. In a time when many communities are cutting budgets for their libraries or even shutting their libraries, this town has built an important new addition and continues to support this really essential resource for thinkers, readers, writers, and the community. I, when we came here, I, um, the library was the old building on, on Ninth and Vermont, and I loved the children's room in the basement, even if by today's standards it's a little maybe squalid and unsafe, but you could be private and secret down there. And it's one of the things that I really enjoy about the children's room, aside from being very moved that it was named for my mother. Um, I like the fact that they've replicated that with all the little kind of um, fabric houses and cubby holes that kids can squirrel away in and feel safe and away from the world around them. My remarks tonight come out of both a discussion of the arc of my career, but also where we are in my, as I'm looking at a snapshot of today, of libraries, readers, writers, the written word. And I've pulled these remarks together under the title of The Power of the Written Word. I just don't have very much power in my fingers to get this cap off. <laughs> When I was 11, my older brother gave me a copy of Dracula. He had just read it, and he thought it was wonderful. And I was like a little duckling following him. If he said, read it, I read it. I finally stopped that after he suggested War and Peace, and I was like, oh. <laughs> I made it all the way to the end, and that was the end of following Jeremy's recommendations. <laughs> but Dracula terrified me so much that I stopped sleeping. I would lie in bed all night waiting for Dracula to morph into a wolf and crash through my window. We lived in the country out on uh, east of town on 15th Street, and our nearest neighbors were cows on one side and cornfields on the other, perfect cover for lurking vampire wolves. While well, Jeremy, my brother, was conscience-stricken, he gave me one of my mother's sterling silver dinner knives to sleep with because in Stoker's novel, Silver Keeps the Vampire at Bay. The novel helped, a, I mean, the knife helped a little, but my mother found it tucked in my bedclothes. She was furious that I had taken Silver out of the dining room. So my long insomniac nights began again until at three one morning, a noise brought me to the window and I saw a whole pack of wolves in the truck garden behind our house. I screamed so loudly that my parents and all of my brothers came running. The neighbor's cows had trampled down the fence in the night and were helping themselves to our sweet corn. My father went out to the garden and sent them home, which was not bad for a guy who'd grown up in the tenements of Brooklyn. So I was a heroine of sorts for saving the vegetables, but I never did overcome my nighttime fears my long bouts of insomnia where I imagined terrors of all kinds stalking me. 
Actually, my standalone novel, Bleeding Kansas, is set here in Douglas County. One of the families in it runs a dairy farm. And perhaps someone who can't tell the difference between a wolf and a cow had no business <laughs> writing about dairy farming. But it occurred to me far too late that I could have created a bestseller about zombie vampire cows. <laughs> Actually, Stephen King and I were born in the same year, and we published our first books in the same year. And while I've sold about 500,000 books and he's sold about 500 million, you can't really tell us apart. <laughs> um, and so maybe I'll send him a message and suggest vampire, zombie vampire cows for his next terror foray. I remain a chronically bad sleeper. A few years ago, I consulted a cognitive behavior sleep therapist who tried to help me learn what they call good sleep hygiene. The phrase kind of made me laugh because it called to mind the moral hygiene campaigns of the early 20th century designed to keep young men from contracting syphilis. I guess young women were presumed born knowing good hygiene, and if they didn't, they were wicked and beyond saving. The sleep therapist told me not to read any stimulating books if I woke in the middle of the night. Well, the only book that understimulates me is Capital in the 21st Century. I want to read Thomas Piketty. I really do. I really want new ideas about society and economic decisions, but that is the only book that will put me to sleep in under two minutes. When I was a child, my parents used to call me Sarah Bernhardt. It wasn't exactly affectionate. The name reflected their frustration with me for making drama or melodrama out of life. My mother's reaction to finding her silver in my bedsheets was only one of our many misunderstandings. I was terrified of vampire wolves, perfectly reasonable. As Polly said, no fiction tells you the truth through imagination. Um, but she thought I was trying to attract attention by enacting histrionics. So when I was about 10, my parents gave me Mark Twain's personal recollections of Joan of Arc to read. They wanted me to see the dire fate that awaits girls who feel life too intensely, who overreact to the world around them. Unfortunately, reading about Joan had a ricochet effect. Her life didn't make me want to retreat to a model of domestic calmness that my parents desired. Instead, I longed for Joan's ardor. I longed for a vision of the magnitude of hers and the strength to execute it. Every now and then, an interviewer will ask me to name the books that shaped me. It's a frequent interview question. Good Housekeeping even runs a regular feature asking different writers what books shaped them. The phrase itself conjures up an image of a ghostly figure draped in gauzy black. A book appears, perhaps Little Women or All Boys Aren't Blue, and the figure takes on a recognizable form. I wouldn't say that Dracula or personal recollections of Joan of Arc shaped me. Rather, they put into words the shape that I still inhabit, not deliberately, but just by my personality, all these years later. On the one hand, powerful and violent people terrify me. Not brave by nature, I often freeze in the face of their rage. I find it hard to stand up for what I believe in. At the same time, on the other hand, I'm ardent in the fight for what I see as justice and freedom. I hope my longing for justice will be strong enough to keep me from running away or staying silent in the face of terror. Another thing I took from Joan of Arc's death was a lifelong fear of fire. After Mark Twain, I read about the fires of the Spanish Inquisition and England's bloody Mary Tudor. One of the most harrowing scenes for me in Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall is the scene where the boy Thomas witnesses the auto de fe of some dissenters on the streets of London. Fire looms large in many of my novels, not on purpose, but looking at them in retrospect. Arson is the theme of burn marks, 
Flames of all kind are burning through bleeding Kansas. V.I. and a Catholic nun are both damaged in a terrible fire in my novel Hardball. I fear above everything the destruction of the self, of myself, and how much more completely can you be destroyed than by fire? On October 27th, 1553, 469 years ago tomorrow, John Calvin had Michael Servetus burned at the stake in Geneva because of his anti-Trinitarian writings. Catholic authorities were equally incensed with Servetus. They had arrested him and were planning to burn him along with all of his books themselves. Servetus managed to escape the French Catholic prison and so the bishops allowed Protestant John Calvin to do the honors. Uh, Servetus had had the audacity, both Catholic and Protestant authorities cried, to read Jewish and Islamic writings in an effort to understand these religions. The only reason to read non-Christian texts, the French bishops said, was to condemn the texts and then kill the writers, or at least condemn them to eternal court torment. Well, the printing press was about a century old in 1553, and writers already felt compelled to create books filled with their exciting thoughts. Servetus, like so many other writers, didn't stop to think about the effect his words would have on readers. So far in contemporary America, we have not killed any writers, at least that I can think of, for their provocative or offensive words. But on August 12th of this year, we came close. Someone stabbed Salman Rushdie on a stage in western New York or attacked him, and stabbed him 15 times before he was restrained. I read yesterday as I was getting ready to leave my house and come here that Rushdie has permanently lost the use of one eye and one hand. Rushdie had been receiving death threats ever since he published the Satanic Verses in 1988 when the Ayatollah Khomeini issued the fatwa calling for his death. While Rushdie escaped murder 33 years ago, Others who supported his work were not so fortunate. His Japanese translator was stabbed to death, and although they both survived, his Norwegian publisher was shot, and his Italian publisher was stabbed. A number of Pakistanis died in the riots around the book. Bombs were set off in bookshops in, <coughs> excuse me, in the United Kingdom. In the United States, bookstores refused to carry the satanic verses out of fear of these attacks. Norman Mailer, the head of PEN America, the organization dedicated to protecting writers' speech around the world, had to be coerced into defending Rushdie. This was the man who stabbed his wife to prove his masculinity, but terrorists wanting to blow up bookstores were a little much for him. Meanwhile, the Cardinal Archbishop of New York condemned the writer. Rushdie had been asking for trouble with his provocative language, the archbishop said. I couldn't help thinking of the way women who've been raped are treated. She dressed provocatively. She was asking for it. Rushdie dressed his book in provocative language. Well, those violent acts were then, but his stabbing is now, and it comes at the same time that speech and books and libraries are under serious assault in the United States. In the last 12 months, 2,532 titles have been banned in school libraries across the country. Texas leads the list with 801 bans in 22 school districts. They also lead the list in that the state attorney general has himself compiled the list and he's required public libraries to pull the titles. In 32 states, though, at least some districts have, en have enacted bans, including Illinois. In Kansas, two Sedgwick County districts have banned a total of 30 titles. So far in, in 2022, the American Library Association has documented attempts to ban 1,600 books in public libraries. A number of towns and counties are closing their libraries not for budget reasons, but for carrying books that offend some of the residents. Jamestown, Michigan is one. The library carried a book called Gender Queer, among other books which presented LGBTQ experience in a supportive light. 
though his t that title and others like it caused a well-orchestrated hysteria in the community and led to the shutting, shuttering of the library. In Llano County, Texas, when librarian Suzette Baker refused to pull titles from the library as commanded by the county and the state attorney general, she was fired and the library was closed. However, in Llano County, people in the community are fighting back. Layla Green Little, a local patron who is a speech therapist, not a member of government, not on the library board, just an ordinary citizen and patron of the library. She is in court this month. She is the lead plaintiff for members of Llano County readers who don't want censorship and who do want their library. She is a woman of great courage. Like her, members of other members of library boards and school boards who stand up for the First Amendment have been stalked. They have received death threats. They have been confronted in public by small gangs of red-faced people shouting threats and obscenities at them. And most heinous of all, they have had their children's lives and safety threatened. This is frankly a terrifying time in our country for readers, writers, booksellers, and libraries. Ever since the passage of the USA Patriot Act in 2001, libraries and librarians have been on the front line both in protecting speech and in being in the crosshairs of those attacking our most sacred right. This act gives the FBI carte blanche to issue national security lecture letters to any person or institution, and these letters can seek any kind of information, including library circulation records. Since the act includes a gag order which forbids recipients from discussing the letter with anyone, be it spouse, attorney, or coworker, we don't actually know what these letters have been requesting. Before the act, the FBI issued about 2,000 letters, national security letters a year. Now the number is about 60,000, so 30 times as many. How many of these have gone to libraries? We don't know, except for the case of George Christian. He is the Connecticut librarian who was actually jailed for consulting the library's lawyer when his library was issued a national security letter demanding circulation records of the patrons. In the wake of the act, li libraries across the country came up with systems to protect us, their patrons, their readers, from having our internet and circulation records inspected by the government. Not enough people know of this quiet, important work, but those of us who do are very grateful. In today's highly inflamed world, libraries are squeezed between the departments of justice and homeland security and the volatile Volatile, volatile, violent public. I have to say my own favorite band book is And Tango Makes Three. This is the picture book which tells the true story of a pair of male penguins in the Central Park Zoo who adopted an abandoned egg. They kept it warm under their feet, turning it just the way hetero penguins do, and when it hatched, they guided it to maturity. The zoo st excuse me, the zoo staff named the baby Tango. Well, the protests against Tango were vociferous and the book was widely banned. I don't know, maybe Moms for Liberty thought the zoo tenders should have fried that egg rather than letting a pair of gay penguins hatch it and raise it. I am grateful that I've never received death threats. I do feel a little hurt that I've never had any of them. <laughs> None of my books has ever been banned uh, or challenged. And it's like, what am I, chopped liver? <laughs> but as the level of anger in the country has risen, so has the vitriol even I have received in emails. A number of my novels have touched on issues around immigrants and refugees. Readers who want to limit the number of refugees and immigrants who come into this country have always written to protest the positive depiction I give immigrants since I'm the granddaughter of people whose lives were saved by being able to come to this country. It's very dear to my heart. They tell me to stop forcing my liberal politics down their throat, and, but in the last five years, these letters have become more inflamed. The thing that baffled me, though, is that my most recent novel, the one I published this year, Overboard, 
has generated the angriest letters, and really, this is my least political of anything I've written in the last decade. So I was baffled by <laughs> one of the things that happens when people send you hate mail is they lose all control of spelling and grammar, and so sometimes <laughs> it's hard to know what they are actually trying to say. I don't know if you've read the screw tape letters, but there's one letter in which screw tape gets so angry as he's writing that the letter breaks off because he's turned into a, a, um, a serpent mid letter. And that's kind of what I think of them. They're sitting there with these hate, <laughs> and suddenly they've turned into a serpent and they lose control over the language. But um, I couldn't figure out why, why I was getting these until finally about the 10th one, I was a libtard. Actually, I like that insult because I always think of it, it sounds like a liberal wearing a leotard, dancing with the Bolshoi. Um, anyway, I was baffled by what was causing the screaming until one reader spelled it out. In Overboard, VI requires people to wear masks when they are in her office. This made me a fascist, a libtard, an anti-American, anti-freedom, and so on and so on and so on. One reader hoped robbers would break into my home and that the police wouldn't show up, which maybe that is a sort of circumlocutory death threat, but she was in Florida and she said she was sure I lived in L.A., so I haven't felt particularly at risk. Most readers who object to my writing say they want to be entertained, not exposed to political rhetoric. Well, three books that the Lano Library Board demanded its librarian remove are... My butt is so noisy. I broke my butt, and I need a new butt. <laughs> you would think those were entertainment. Maybe not for you, but definitely for your three- or four-year-old. However, they have become political books because of their central place in a political fight. Seen through different twists of a kaleidoscope, many books that many readers think are apolitical actually do have a political message. For example, the English, English crime novels of the so-called golden age of the mystery, Dorothy Sayers, Agatha Christie, Josephine Tay, and so on, they make the unconscious assumption that an upper or upper middle class person will have more intelligence, compassion, and insight than an ordinary person. Charles Parker, the police inspector in the Dorothy Sayers novels, is never going to be as clever as Eton, Oxford-educated Lord Peter Whimsey. The upper classes will keep law and order for the good of the whole society by virtue of their birth. We don't question a system where hereditary wealth and privilege gives Whimsey enormous unearned and largely unchecked power. Sayers and Josephine Tay both exhibited a casual anti-Semitism in their work that makes me wince. However, that too reflects the attitudes of many ordinary readers in the 1930s and sadly a certain number today as well. On the U.S. side of the Atlantic in that same era, Rex Stout, did you know that Rex Stout grew up in Douglas County? He attended Wakarusa number no. 6, now, my brothers and I went to Caw Valley 95, and Wakarusa number no. 6 was our arch enemy at baseball. They, I think they red-shirted their kids so that 25-year-olds were playing us. <laughs> anyway, Stout's books often have a very sexist and racist outlook that make me flinch, but I suffer that because I do have pleasure in the Wolf Goodwin stories. No one thinks of these authors as political. Their politics and their attitudes on social justice mirrored the status quo. When readers object to my politics or butt writer Don McMillan's, they're really objecting to a point of view that they don't share. By labeling it political or, in the butt's case, pornographic, this just really, I'm sorry, but you know, this is a picture book and you see the backside of a sexually unspecified child with a butt. But that has been labeled as pornography. So these, these critics, which would be funny if it was just us talking about them, if they didn't wield so much power and rage, they are othering us as writers. We are the ones with a political outlook because they don't share that outlook. We can be vilified, excluded, and threatened. 
I don't set out to write any book, actually, with a social justice message in mind. I write fiction. I try to think of crimes that a solo private operative could take on. I hope to write good, understandable prose, and I hope to entertain readers whom I will probably never meet. My initial urge to create my own detective came out of a desire to change the narrative about women in crime fiction. From about the age of 13 on, I read crime novels in preference to almost any other kind of book. In fact, so much so that when I took my PhD history orals at the University of Chicago back in the 1970s, I read something like two dozen crime novels a month before my exams. I don't know what I knew that I made me pass the exams, but uh, it took me a long time to figure out my true career direction. I became a more sophisticated reader and I discovered that the lives of women in fiction were as limiting or maybe even more limiting than the lives of my friends and me. Broadly speaking, women in the mystery have been the deceptive, manipulative monsters of whom the archetype is Bridget O'Shaughnessy in the Maltese Falcon, or they have been the innocent, virginal types who get themselves in a peck of trouble and are rescued by a male hero. Even Harriet Vane and the combined female intelligences of Shrewsbury College need Peter Whimsey to rescue them, and Dorothy Sayers called herself a feminist. Crime fiction throughout much of its 150-year history defined women by our sexual behavior. Good girls were chaste. Bad girls were not. Chaste girls could not act effectively. Starting with Lady Audley's Secret, published by Mary Elizabeth Braddon in 1862, bad girls could act, but they could only do evil deeds. Notable, 19, uh, notable 20th century heroines include Carmen Sternwood in Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep. The first time Carmen sees Philip Marlowe in the hallway of her father's house, she greets him just as you or I might welcome a stranger. Marlowe tells us, she turned her body slowly and lithely without lifting her feet. Her hands dropped limp at her sides. She tilted herself toward me on her toes. She fell straight back into my arms. I had to catch her or let her crack her head on the tessellated floor. I had to hold her close to hold her up. When her head was against my chest, she screwed it around and giggled at me. Now, I would ask you not to try this maneuver at home without... <laughs> right. Of course, some women in crime fiction defied those stereotypes. Georgia Strangeways, Nicholas Blake's explorer heroine, is resilient and heroic in his 1939 novel, The Smiler with the Knife. Perhaps the most defiant of all, in a cheerful, jello-eating way, was Nancy Drew. Nancy was beautiful, poised, skilled in every art known to man or woman. She could grapple as easily with a broken down car or the law of the lever as she could with ballroom dancing. There was one Nancy Drew story where she actually tap danced SOS on the walls of the, street, of the locked cabin where she was being held as a kidnap victim on a ship. She possessed independence, money, and the things that money can buy, like a sporty roadster. I was sure it was red, and people said, no, it was blue, and I had to go look at it. Yeah, it was blue. So Nancy was the ringleader of her set, and she was known as much for her charity as for her quick wits. Nancy lacked only two things, siblings and domestic responsibilities. Everything came so easily to her that I couldn't identify with her. The heroines I turned to, who consoled me and gave me space in the private room of my mind, battled against the limiting odds of female experience. They were often plain. They were buried under Cinderella-like mountains of domestic chores. They were poor, and they were usually told that the work they aspired to was a closed door to girls. They triumphed despite these obstacles, but the price they paid was usually high. I guess my female heroes had to be Joan of Arc. Raise the siege of Orléans, crown the Dauphin, die by fire. When I started writing my first novel, second wave feminism felt like a powerful force in women's lives. 
We had access to safe, legal abortions. We were knocking down barriers to our participation in field after field. When one of my sisters-in-law was applying to medical school, she kept hearing that they already had their one-woman student. But when her daughter was applying 25 years later, women made up half or more of medical school classes. My parents sent me through secretarial school so that I'd always have a job skill to fall back on. But in 1982, when my first book, Indemnity Only, was published, there was, for the first time ever, a woman on the Supreme Court. And starting also in 1982, women could serve as regular police officers in Chicago and other major cities instead of as matrons in the juvenile and women's prisons. When I think back to how I imagined my work at the beginning, I believe I had the ludicrous notion that all I had to do was show people what an independent woman looked like. She could have a sex life that didn't determine her moral character. She could make important decisions in her professional and personal life without adult supervision. When she spoke, people listened. As soon as people saw this as reality, their attitudes would change and the fight for equality and justice would be on its way to being won. Instead, 40 years later, we gave our highest office to a man who bragged about his sexual predations. We silenced the women who tried to testify that they had been assaulted by a Supreme Court nominee. And if they spoke up anyway, we trolled them viciously. Looking back on the arc of my life and work now that I'm in my 70s, I believe what drives me, the issue that underlies all others, is that I want my voice, I want women's voices to be heard, to be taken seriously, to be attended to. When I helped start Sisters in Crime 35 years ago, it was in response to the widespread experience of women writers that our books were not taken seriously. At one crime writer's conference, my male dinner partner inquired into my marital status and my husband's occupation. My dinner partner said it was good that I had this hobby of writing to occupy my time so that I didn't burden my husband with domestic trivia. Other women at other conferences reported similar insults. But the biggest insult was that book review publications did not pay attention to our work. Sisters in Crime's first project was to monitor some 200 newspapers, book reviews, and literary magazines to get the numbers. We found that normalizing the number of titles published by men and women, a book by a man was seven times more likely to be reviewed than a book by a woman. This had disastrous economic consequences. Libraries, which then and now are the biggest buyers of books, didn't know that many women writers existed because they never saw our names. Now, Sisters has changed that particular situation, even if some of our other goals have remained elusive. The actor Gina Davis, concerned about the way that women are depicted in television and film, worked with the Annenberg Foundation to do some basic research on women in the screen. In a 2010 report, the foundation found that in 1970, women spoke 28% of the lines in movies. In 2010, women spoke about 28% of the lines in television and movies. Davis recently revisited this research because we are now seeing so many strong women characters, particularly in, in television series or streaming series. But she found that when both sexes are on the screen at the same time, the girl listens, the boy talks. In other words, in a 40-year period where women became astronauts and Supreme Court judges, there's been no change in the amount of speech women are allowed. This on-screen experience mirrors real-life social experience. A variety of studies, most recently by Yale University professor Victoria Brascoli, Shows that it show that in mixed groups, whether at work or at play, women typically can speak about one-third of the time. If we take up more space, more time than that, 
both men and women marshal social pressures to silence us. After the second Clinton-Trump debate, where Trump paced the stage looming behind Hillary when she spoke, he kept complaining that the moderators had given her more time than him. The numbers show that he actually took a bit more than his share, 40 plus minutes to her 39. But I guess when you're used to having two thirds of the speaking time, equality feels like evaporation. For some women, the constant onslaught makes us reluctant to take up space, whether physically or psychically. The widespread concern over obesity in America makes us ignore the way that women try to make ourselves small, as if to say, look, I'm not that big, I'm not that much of a threat. I personally have found that one thing I have to work on is if I'm in a meeting where there's confrontational, potentially confrontational subjects being discussed, my voice goes up half a register and I have to really work. I'm not threatening and I have to work to keep it down. A friend of mine from the country Colombia said that in similar situations, although her English is accentless and impeccable, she finds herself taking on a thick Spanish accent. I'm just an immigrant. I'm not threatening. So, you know, it's terrible to know that we've internalized this to this degree. But this desire to make ourselves small gets reflected in crime fiction, where women heroes are often small. Sue Grafton's Kinsey Malone is described as 5'6" and weighing 118 pounds, and various other women heroes in other books are that size, and they're described as big. Tom, Thomas Topher, his name was, in the book Coda, has a villain who is five foot six and 118 pounds, and she tackles him in bed, and he says, Fiona Shaw was big. Yeah, right. I will say, although maybe it's more information than you want to have about me, that I am five foot six and I weigh 130 pounds, and if I lost 12 pounds, I think you would want to stage an intervention, not to <laughs> send me out on the streets taking on villains. Today, as we all experience the rollback in women's lives, in women's right to be treated as adults, able to make our most intimate health care decisions, I no longer have the energetic optimism that fueled me in 1982. On good days, I'm worried. On bad days, I'm terrified. As a writer committed to storytelling, it's inevitable that these fears will seep into my books. I try to be aware of what readers want to read, but if I don't write first of all for myself, to explore situations and characters that matter to me, my work will be no better than painting by numbers. It will become static and cardboard-like. When I was doing research for this talk, I came on a book called Books on Fire by a French historian named Lucien Polistron. It was a fascinating history in a sort of hideous way because it detailed the many millions of books and scrolls and papyri that have been burned in the brief 5,000 years of the written word. Faced with the many millions of books destroyed in the Second World War and the many millions of lives that were destroyed, some of the writers that Polistron quotes threw up their hands in despair. What was the point of writing anything, of adding to the world's philosophy or poetry or stories, if their words had no effect on public behavior, if books were still burned, if people were still massacred by the millions? These writers felt so helpless that they retreated behind a self-created wall of silence. I have the opposite reaction. I think instead that the passion books inflame is proof that they are doing their job and that we writers are doing our job. Stalin murdered the poets Mandelstam and Svetaeva. Writers have been burned at the stake for their words. Besides Michael Servetus and Calvin's Geneva, we have Rabbi Akiba burned by the Romans in 137 CE Jerusalem, but their words have endured. Indeed, legend has it that as Akiba's body began to be consumed in the flames, 
the Hebrew words took physical shape and flew to heaven where they guided home his soul. As the French writer Sebastian Castellio wrote when he learned of Servetus's murder, to kill a person does not destroy an idea. All it does is kill a person. The Egyptian pharaoh Ramesses II, who died around 1200 BCE, had his tomb built over his great palace in Thebes. Underneath the tomb are three chambers, one the dining hall, one the great reception hall, and the third his library. The tomb has long since been looted. We don't know what he read or collected, but chiseled over his library doorway is the inscription, the cure for the soul. When I walk into a library, when I smell the books, when I smell the foxing, the binding, I feel as though I have come home. I feel the strong voices of other writers speaking to me. I hear Frederick Douglass and Harriet Beecher Stowe rouse a complacent North to the evils of slavery. I hear Sojourner Truth tell me that the hand that rocks the cradle can also rock the boat, and I hear William Lloyd Garrison say, I am in earnest, I will not be silenced. My soul is cured when I stand among books. They give me strength for the journey. 2,600 years ago, the poet Sappho wrote, although they are only breath, words which I command are immortal. That word which is only breath has survived countless wars, fires, murders, mutilations. That word will endure, it will triumph, but only if those of us in this room who have dedicated our lives to the written word stand strong. For myself, I pray that in the turbulent days that are surely coming, I will keep my shape aligned with Joan, that I will not let fear silence me. I pray she will help me face and fight the monsters that seek to devour us. Thank you very much. Have any questions? Yes. It is, it is, <laughs> although it is a work of fiction and there is no resemblance between, but dang, I haven't been to Lawrence since before the lockdown, and when I walked down 9th Street, the pig doesn't open until two in the afternoon. I'm like, where do I get my cortado now? <laughs> yes, yeah, in the back. <laughs> Nancy Drew's Roadster was actually yellow. <laughs> and I realized that VI's Mustang, I, I, I have someone at home actually fact-checking this. In the book that I'm working on now, actually VI comes back to Lawrence and um, it's such a complicated story, I can't even begin to unravel it myself, but I had a wonderful meeting today with the new Lawrence police chief who, um, I just think he's an amazing guy. He just seems to have such a zest for life. I was cheered up and energized being around him. But anyway, I'm like, is her Mustang yellow or red? I can't remember now. So. No, it's South Chicago is a neighborhood. I say North Side. Yeah, but South Chicago is a specific neighborhood like Hyde Park or, or McKinley Park. Okay. Although I do make mistakes and as long as, you know, early in my career, I would get wonderful letters from older readers who, you know, now I've been writing for so long that I'm afraid they're dead, but I would make, <laughs> mistakes and they would just they would write such wonderful letters 
like I would get two neighborhoods confused and, and they would tell me so many interesting things about their childhood experience in that neighborhood that uh, it, was, it was great getting those letters and kind of, I, I kind of feel like a vampire on people's experiences. <laughs> Mr. Contreras, uh, you know, a lot of his, his history is, comes from some of those reader letters. Anything else? Yes. How has new technology affected my methodology? Well, one of the things, not my methodology, but VIs, I think the internet is, makes it challenging to write the kind of book that I write because the detective should be out active. She shouldn't be sitting in front of a computer. You know, I love Donna Leone's early books, but in the middle of the book, in the middle of the series, she gets this secretary who does all the investigating online for Brunelli, and it's like, oh, you know, he's just standing around drinking espresso and eating cornetti, and you know, not that that's a bad life, but it's not very exciting. And so, trying to create drama and, and excitement, and still be cognizant of modern technology, I, I think is is quite a challenge. For me, uh, it's made me a little lazy, maybe, in um, relying too much on the net for research and not enough for hands-on. So one of the things, in fact, that I'm doing here in, in Lawrence is is doing site locations for... Um, at the heart of the story is a land grab by an evildoer from Wichita. Um, <laughs> um, and so I've been trying to locate... I thought it was going to be on Blue Mound, so my brother drove me out to Blue Mound today. Well, first of all, hiking to the top of Blue Mound didn't look possible. I couldn't see any place where you could get access to hiking trails, but also it's awfully far from Lawrence, which I wasn't realizing from just looking at Google Maps. So I, I think that um, the, the prudent writer, if she has the time and the energy, should still do site visits. Yes. Well, books are on my nightstand. Um, well, I'm halfway through The Weight of Ink, and I sort of think I'm not going to finish it. It's really well written, but I, I suddenly just couldn't take more of the misery in it. Um, it's, it's, really, it's a book set in partly in contemporary London, uh, a research library, and, and partly in a 17th century Jewish immigrant community in, in London, and the research is wonderful, and the writing is really at a very high level, but uh, no more pogroms for me, please. Um, so I, I've, God, I'm reading in, even in the dark night by Javier Cercas, which is sort of a crime novel. I'm trying to think, of, my brain is such a sieve these days, I can't think of anything that I've been reading um, and yet I have been reading a fair amount. Oh, get back to me on that one. How about one more question and then we'll move to the book. Yes, ma'am. That's correct. So the question had to do with the fact that there's only been one movie and why is it? I didn't like the movie, but... Um, I actually have no power in this situation. The contract that I signed, which was standard for 1986 when I signed it, gave Disney, the parent company, exclusive and perpetual rights to screen depictions of the character. And I spent a lot of money trying to get those rights back unsuccessfully. Um, and over the years, a number of production companies had wanted, particularly to make television series, TNT tried to, but Disney just, they didn't want to do anything themselves, but they also wouldn't even consider partnering with another production company. Right now, and I, you know, I'm sort of afraid of the evil eye, but um, I'm very afraid of the evil eye, what am I saying? Uh, they're actually, <laughs> When Disney acquired Fox's um, entertainment channels, they suddenly had a need for more content. And so now they have actually commissioned 
at least a screenplay for a pilot of a, of a streamed series about her. I don't know, they've had that option for two years and it runs out January 15th, so I'm, I have to say I'm not optimistic, but it, it still could happen. And I, I have a feeling that that's probably my last, my last stab at it, but no, I would love to see her done properly on the screen, yeah. Well, thank you all very much. I'll be in the back <laughs> signing books, and um, thank you. <laughs>